Greetings, a very happy welcome to this course on special topics in atomic physics or I prefer to call it as select topics in atomic physics, because the subject is vast and there is only a certain selection of topics that one could do in a course. And uh, we begin with a tribute to Satyendranath Bose and of course, to Albert Einstein who has perhaps more than anybody else contributed to the growth of quantum mechanics in the last century. And uh, I begin with a quote from uh, Fenman, he asks a question that if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words. Uh, Feynman goes on to answer this question and he says that it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms and this is what we find in volume 1 of Feynman lectures. So, quite obviously atomic physics is a very exciting field and uh, the subject grew along with quantum mechanics in the last century large number of scientists, theorists and experimentalists have contributed to the growth of this field. And uh, I have reviewed some of the excitement in the developments in atomic physics in a talk which was given as a special lecture for the NPTEL and the National Knowledge Network. This is available on the YouTube called an Odyssey in Atomic Physics. But what we will do in this course is to go through some of the important areas on which studies in atomic physics are based. And uh, this course will be covered in 40 lectures. So, in addition to today, today's introductory lecture, there will be 39 lectures that will follow. And we will cover this in 8 units. In the first unit, I will discuss the quantum mechanics and symmetry of the hydrogen atom. In the second unit, I will discuss angular momentum algebra and the quantum mechanics of angular momentum and the wigner ricard theorem. In the third unit, we will study the relativistic hydrogen atom, the Dirac equation and the Foley with Eisen transformations. In the fourth unit, we will go over to many electron atoms and talk about the self consistent field and the Hartree Fock method of getting many electron wave functions. In unit 5, we will talk about perturbative analysis of relativistic effects and in unit 6, we will study how an atom is probed and one could use either collisions or photoionization to study this. And in unit 7, we will discuss photoionization in some further detail in which we will use the boundary conditions which we would develop in unit 6, because for photoionization you need uh, one set of boundary conditions as opposed to another set of boundary conditions for collisions. And then finally, in unit 8, we will study about atoms in external fields. Uh, we will talk about the Stark effect, the Zeeman effect and also provide a very rudimentary in introduction to some exciting phenomena like um, laser cooling, the Bose-Einstein condensation and um, atomic clocks, autosecond metrology and so on. So, I will give a very brief overview of what we are going to do in this course and how we will do it. But first of all, let me explain who this course is meant for and I would like to inform or suggest that this course is best suited for those who have got some introduction to quantum mechanics, but not a whole lot, because the subject of quantum mechanics and atomic physics developed together in the last century. And a foundation for a course in atomic physics requires a strong background in quantum mechanics. So, some of it will be developed as an integral part of the course. So, you do need a little bit of introduction to quantum mechanics, but perhaps not a whole lot. If you already know a lot, you perhaps do not need this course at all. Then, 
I will also like to mention how to benefit most from this course, because I am going to be using the course material is developed and I will be using some of these PowerPoint slides for this course and these will be uploaded as PDF files on the course web page. So, it is a good idea to refer to these PDF files, you do not have to sit down and take notes during the class, but it is a good idea to refer to these PDF files before the lectures, during the lectures, after the lectures and in the class just concentrate on the discussion, ask questions, have conversations right. Okay, that is the best way to take this course. Now, of course, if you have any questions at any point, you should send them to me and I will now give a brief overview of what we will do in unit 1, which will be on the quantum mechanics and symmetry of the hydrogen atom. So, the hydrogen atom along with alkali metal atoms belongs to the first group and they all have an outer n s 1 electronic configuration. All the alkali atoms like sodium atom, rubidium atom, cesium atom you know these are all you know they all have a similar structure and uh, one of the things which is uh, used which is very well known about the spectra of these atoms are the famous d 1 d 2 lines of the alkali atoms. Okay. Sodium has them, rubidium has them, cesium has them right, all of them have got the d 1 d 2 lines. Hydrogen does not, although it belongs to the same group and the question is where have the d 1 d 2 lines of hydrogen disappeared and the reason of course, is that the 3 p and 3 s energy levels of the hydrogen atom are degenerate. Whereas, for other alkali atoms the outer n p and outer n s, where n is 3 for sodium, but it is 2 for lithium um, and then so on right. So, for rubidium, cesium and so on. So, the outer n p and n s levels are not degenerate and you do need a difference in the, the energies of n p and n s to have a d 2 p transition. There is a further spin orbit splitting, but that is a matter of detail, which we will we'll also be discussing in a separate unit, which is a relativistic effect. But essentially one recognizes the fact that the eigenvalue spectrum of hydrogen is not just quantitatively, but qualitatively different from that of the other members of the group 1 atoms. And this is the problem that we will discuss in the first unit. Uh, we will introduce uh, the complete set of commuting operators corresponding to complete set of compatible observations that can be made on the hydrogen atom, because this is what a physicist looks for to study any quantum system. And we will therefore, introduce some basic foundations of quantum mechanics toward the beginning, so that we know what are the measurable properties of the hydrogen atom and how can we get a complete set of commuting operators. When we study this, it turns out that the, if you look at the radial part of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, it reduces to a one dimensional problem, if you just look at the radial part and then by fundamental theorems in quantum mechanics, one knows that the energy spectrum is not degenerate. So, there is a one to one correspondence between energy and wave functions for the hydrogen atom according to this theorem. So, the degeneracy of the 2 s and 2 p levels in the hydrogen atom cannot be explained on the basis of this fundamental theorem. In fact, it is in contradiction to the consequence of this, the result of this theorem. So, this is what was called as accidental degeneracy, but then it is now understood in the in terms of the complete symmetry of the hydrogen atom, which is not just S O 3, but it is S O 4. This is sometimes called as the Fox symmetry. So, we will discuss the Fox symmetry of the hydrogen atom, we will develop the Casimir operators for this uh, for S O 4 and by studying the group properties of this particular symmetry, which is ISO 4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom. We will get the eigenvalue spectrum of the hydrogen atom and we will recognize that it explains the degeneracy in the hydrogen atom 
and it is not really an accidental degeneracy, there is a good physical reason for it. Then in unit 2, we will study angular momentum in quantum mechanics. Okay, angular momentum in classical mechanics is just r cross p, but quantum mechanics requires a different treatment of angular momentum and we will proceed to get the wigner ricard theorem as well. So, we will give an appropriate definition of angular momentum in quantum mechanics and then use this definition to deal with the algebra of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. So, we will discuss things like what are the values of angular momenta. Now, we all know from our earlier introduction in quantum mechanics to electron spin that electron spin is one half and one finds that from the angular momentum algebra you can get these half integer quantum numbers like j equal to half, not only j equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etcetera, which are the integers, but you can also get half, 3 half and so on. So, we will explain how it is possible to get these half integer quantum numbers. We will also highlight the fact that because this method accommodates half integer quantum numbers, it is not the same as assigning a half integer quantum number to the electron. Okay. That has to come only from relativistic quantum mechanics, it comes from the Dirac equation as we will discuss later in a different unit. So, we will have a fairly extensive discussion on the rotation group, because angular momentum is the generator of rotations. Uh, we will uh, discuss the um, Wigner rotation matrices, which you find on the cover page of Sakurai's book. So, these are obviously important in quantum mechanics in all aspects of quantum mechanics, not just atomic physics, but in many other branches of quantum mechanics in with applications in nuclear physics and everywhere. So, these are the matrix elements of the rotation operator in angular momentum states and we will study the properties of the Wigner rotation matrices a little bit. We will then recognize that the total angular momentum for any system is given by the quantum vector sum of all contributors to angular momentum and you could have the orbital angular momentum as one contributor, you could have the spin angular momentum as another contributor. In a many particle system, you may have the orbital angular momenta and the spin angular momenta of all the different particles and all of them would add up to give a net angular momentum of the quantum system and this is done by adding. Now, this is not just a vector addition, these are quantum vector operators. So, one has to develop the tools to study this addition of these vector operators and this is done using these coefficients called as the klebsch gordon coefficients. We will discuss how these klebsch gordon coefficients are obtained, you can get them from first principles. You, there are certain recursion relations which are available, so that if you know the root coefficient from this root coefficient, you can get the rest of the coefficients. So, we will discuss some of these methods and then we will establish the wigner Eckhart theorem and find that it is extremely powerful tool in spectroscopy because it tells us that the probability amplitude for transition from a certain initial state to a final state, which is what we investigate in spectroscopy. This probability amplitude can be factored into two pieces, a physical part which is called as a reduced matrix element and a geometrical part which is contained in the klebsch gordon coefficient. So, this in fact goes on to give us the selection rules the spectroscopic selection rules like the dipole selection rules or the selection rules for quadrupole transitions and so on. So, all kinds of different selection rules come out from the application of the wigner Ricard theorem. In unit 3, we will study the relativistic hydrogen atom and this comes into play because the speed of light is finite and therefore, all consequences of the special theory of relativity must be accounted for and an important consequence is that space intervals and time intervals are not independently invariant under transformations. When you go from one frame to another frame, which is moving even at a constant velocity with respect to an earlier frame. So, all consequences of the, cons of the constancy and the finite value of the speed of light in vacuum have to be accounted for. Now, what it does is 
um, it, it makes us necessary to go beyond the Schrodinger equation and for the electron you make use of the Dirac equation and then uh, study the consequences of the relativistic quantum mechanical equation. Now, in particular what happens is that momentum is what you quantize in quantum mechanics, right. So, the operator for momentum is the minus i h cross gradient operator which you would have learnt in your first course. But then what is momentum? Normally, you would define it as mass times the rate of change of velocity, uh, 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 rate of change of position, right. Velocity is a rate of change of position. So, mass into velocity is the momentum, but the numerator here and the denominator here are not independently invariant under Lorentz transformations. The numerator, the space intervals undergo Lorentz contractions and the time intervals undergo time dilation. So, one has to introduce a four momentum, one has to introduce what is called as a proper velocity and a proper momentum. So, we will go through these um, corrections or revisions to some of the classical ideas in um, non-relativistic classical mechanics. They are important also in, in classical relativistic mechanics, which is, does not involve quantum phenomena. Even there these things are important, but in particular they will be of significance to us in the context of quantum mechanics. So, we will uh, in the process we will also learn what is the correct expression for the relativistic energy of a particle and then we will proceed to quantize the system by having appropriate operators in place of dynamical variables and we will arrive at the famous Dirac equation which you see at the bottom. Now, this Dirac equation of course, has some very important consequences. It when you set it up for the electron you find that it assigns to the electron an additional integral property which is integral to the presence of the electron. Okay. And this is the intrinsic angular momentum of the electron. Now, this can couple to the orbital angular momentum and that is the famous spin orbit coupling, but where is the spin orbit interaction s dot l in the Dirac equation? You do not see it in the form in which you see the Dirac equation in front of you. Okay. But what you can do is subject the Dirac equation to a number of transformations which are known as the foldy Wodeisen transformations and we will discuss this paper to some extent in this unit. That um, this is a, a procedure to transform the Dirac equation to different representations and you go through a series of representations called as the foldy Wodeisen first representation, the second representation and the third representation. And when you go through these different foldy Wodeisen representations, you arrive at a form of the Dirac equation, which is which is completely based on the Dirac equation. But then it attains a form in which the Hamiltonian has got these terms, and you can recognize clearly what are the terms which are responsible for the relativistic kinetic energy correction, or the spin orbit interaction, and so on. So all of these terms which are already there in the Dirac equation, they become manifest. So, the foldy Wodeisen transformation is really an extremely important one to get into the heart of physics, which is coming out of the Dirac equation. So, we will discuss this in some details in this unit. We will also learn about what are the good quantum numbers for a Dirac electron. So, in particular we will discuss the kappa quantum number and then we will proceed to get the radial coupled equations for the large part and the small part of the wave function in the Dirac equation. right? And the motivation to do this is to equip you with some of the preliminary tunes that are required to read about relativistic atomic physics, because you know anything in relativistic uh, in uh, anything in atomic physics will begin with wave functions and quantum numbers and so on. And the appropriate quantum numbers and wave functions are of course, the relativistic ones, because nature does obey relativistic quantum mechanics more so than the non relativistic quantum mechanics for the simple reason that laws of nature are determined also by the finite nights of, of the speed of light. So, if you were to read any of these articles which are uh, the most common 
you know literature or other papers also which are equivalent to them in some sense and they will give you a start and you will get some sort of an introduction to the terminology and the methodology of quantum mechanics which is used in literature. So, you will get some introduction to that as a result of this unit. Then in unit 4, we will have 5 classes on many electron atoms and the method to deal with many electron atoms comes from uh, Hartree further developed by Fock and Slater and some others. And uh, basically it addresses the catch 22 kind of situation that to set up this Schrodinger equation for the n electron system h psi equal to e psi for the n electrons. You need of course, the Hamiltonian, so that you can set up, you can solve the differential equation and get the solutions, but then to be able to set up the Hamiltonian itself you need the solutions in advance. And this is a situation which needs to be addressed and using methods which were developed by Hartree and then further there were contributions to include the electron spin by Fock and Slater. Uh, this is a method which is known as the Hartree Fock method. So, we will discuss the self consistent field method of developed by Hartree Fock. And in this, the problem is addressed using a variational technique in which one minimizes or gets the extremum of the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the n electron quantum mechanical state of the system. And this n electron state must be properly antisymmetrized because the electrons are fermions. And using a properly antisymmetrized n electron state, you obtain a variational extremum of the Hamiltonian subject to certain constraints that the variational orbitals remain orthogonal to each other and they are also normalized. So, subject to these constraints you get variational solutions, they give you a certain set of coupled integral differential equations which are called as the Hartree Fock equations. And essentially this equation emerges as a condition that must be satisfied, so that you get self consistent field solution. So, it is a condition which emerges from this analysis from the variational tool. So, that the constraints are respected and you get an extremum in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So, this is the Hartree Fock equation that we will develop in this unit. We will also express it in what is called as a Hartree Fock equation in the diagonal form and this is a very powerful you know framework, because it tells us that the variational parameters which are introduced in the uh, through via the method of Lagrange's method of variational multipliers, they acquire a very specific physical meaning which is amenable to measurements. So, it connects the Hartree Fock theory to physical measurements directly, because the um, energy values which appear in the Hartree Fock equation in the diagonal form are then associated with the binding energies which are measurable like ionization potential. So, you can carry out some measurements and actually connect them. So, there is a very famous theorem which does this which is known as the Koopmans theorem which we will derive and prove and we will establish this. So, it tells you that the energy difference between an n electron state and an n minus 1 electron state gives you the energy value that appears in the Hartree Fock equation in the diagonal form. So, that is the Koopman's theorem which we will discuss, but this remains valid in an approximation which is called as the independent particle approximation, because even if it takes into account the electron electron interaction 1 over r by r i j, it does leave out what is called as electron electron correlation. And there are two kinds of correlations, one are the exchange correlations or the statistical correlations coming from the electron spin and there are other correlations which are known as Coulomb correlations. And the Coulomb correlations require many body field theoretical methods, second quantization methods, configuration interaction methods and so on. So, one requires you know some further quantum mechanics to develop this which will go beyond the scope of this course, but I will certainly mention that this is what provides the framework for the fundamental Hartree Fock. Of course, one can extend it to what is called as a multi configurational Hartree Fock or if you do a relativistic version you get 
what is called is a multi configurational Dirac fog. There are other methods of dealing with electron correlations like the random phase approximation, the relativistic version is the relativistic random phase approximation and so on. So, there are you know one can go a long way, but then the Hartree fog uh, or the Dirac Hartree fog restricts you to it, it enables you to accommodate the statistical and the exchange correlations, but it leaves out the Coulomb correlations. So, that is the difference and the limitation of the Hartree Fock or the, or in the Dirac Fock method. Then in unit 5, which will be a tiny unit, just two classes in this, we will deal with perturbative analysis of the relativistic effects. So, we would have already considered the relativistic effects in our earlier unit on Dirac equation and foley wadeisen transformations, but in this unit we will see that if you look at these individual corrections, you can think of these terms as corrections to the non-relativistic problem okay, or as additional factors to be taken into account and you can take them into account piece wise like you can plug in the relativistic kinetic energy correction, you can plug in the Darwin correction and you can plug in the spin orbit correction and you can get these corrections using first order perturbation theory or even higher order perturbation theory if you like, in which the energy correction is given by the expectation value of the perturbation Hamiltonian in the unperturbed state. But then the question arises as to what are the appropriate basis sets to be used and this is an important question which we will discuss in this unit and you will find that if you look at the corrections due to the relativistic kinetic energy term or the spin orbit term or the Darwin term, they are all of the same order of magnitude, they are all of the you know the corrections are go as z alpha square, where alpha is the fine structure constant, z is the atomic number. So, they are all equally important and notice that they all depend on the value of L in some way. Okay. So, if you did only this correction, but not the other two, you will get an L dependent answer, but the final Dirac solution which we have already got, which we would have already got in unit 3, in fact would tell us that the Dirac energies depend only on the j value and they are independent of the L value. So, only when you put in all of these three corrections together, you find that the dependence of energy is only on j and not on L quantum numbers. So, how is this to be treated perturbatively? What are the appropriate, you know, unperturbed states which must be used to get the corresponding perturbative corrections. So, this will be the subject of this unit and then in unit 6, we will discuss how an atom is probed and to probe an atom, you need some tools, some, some probe, something which will come and interact with the atom and the kinds of probe that you can think of are either particles like electrons, you can have, you can fire electrons coming out of an electron gun at an atom and see their scattering. right? So, this can be one way of probing the atom. Another way of probing an atom could be to shine light on it and see how the atom responds to this light. So, there are these alternate tools that are available to you like photo ionization or electron ion scattering and so on. And you recognize from this figure that if you go from left to right in this figure, that you have got a photon which is absorbed by an atom giving you an electron and an ion in the final state. This is the same state that you can get if you had completely different ingredients in the initial stage, that if you were to have an electron ion scattering experiment, again you can get an electron and an ion in the final state. So, which means that for the same final state, you can have completely different pairs of ingredients. Okay, in this case, you have got an electron and an ion, in this case you have got a photon and a neutral atom. So, obviously, one expects some sort of a connection between these two processes and indeed there is such a connection, which allows you to develop the techniques in one field in scattering theory for example, and use them in photo ionization and vice versa. So, basically both photo ionization and scattering, they are two aspects of the same quantum mechanics and uh, uh, there is no real fundamental difference between scattering and, and spectroscopy. So, the relationship 
is governed by what is called as the time reversal symmetry in quantum mechanics that um, if, if you have um, an electron and an atom in um, uh, or, uh, or a, a target in the initial state, how you can subject this to a time reversal process and this time reversal process in quantum mechanics it is not just t going to minus t, you have to take into account some additional factors which we will discuss at length in this unit. And we will find that the photoionization and the electron ion scattering solutions are connected by the time reversal symmetry. This is important because it will uh, give you the boundary conditions which are appropriate for the two processes and you must use the wave functions with the correct boundary conditions. So, that you can apply this and get other things like matrix elements, the photoionization cross sections, the angular distributions of photo electrons and so on. And this is what we will study in unit 7, in which we will need the continuum final state solution with appropriate boundary conditions, namely what are known as ingoing wave boundary conditions. So, this is so the difference between the ingoing wave boundary conditions and the outgoing boundary conditions is what we will study in unit 6. And in unit 7, we will apply them to the study of atomic photoionization, in which we will use the wave function for the final state with appropriate boundary conditions in a photoionization experiment and then get the correct expressions for the oscillator strengths, the photoionization cross sections. Okay. And uh, we will also in the process de uh, define what is meant by oscillator strength, what is the classical idea of an oscillator strength, what is the quantum mechanical idea of an oscillator strength and get the estimates of the cross section we will find that at least to a very good approximation which is called as a Born approximation. The photoionization cross section goes it reduces with energy, but it reduces as e to the minus 7 by 2 power of energy and it also goes as z to the 5 as n to the minus 3 and so on. So, these are very important results in quantum mechanics and these will be arrived at in this particular unit. Uh, we will also um, uh, recognize that the matrix elements for transitions can be obtained in different forms like the length form, the velocity form or what is called as a momentum form. And there is also a form uh, known as acceleration form and uh, it was S Chandrasekhar who uh, wrote the formalism for this in a famous paper in 1945. So, we will acquaint ourselves with different alternative ways of the length form and the momentum form in particular of getting uh, the matrix elements. And we will find that these matrix elements can actually undergo a transition in their sign. You can have a matrix element which is positive up to a certain energy and which changes its sign. For example, here for argon you see that this matrix element is negative, this is the 0 and this is where the matrix element is negative and as energy increases from left to right the matrix element changes, it undergoes a change of sign over here and goes through a 0. And when it goes through a 0, the matrix element vanishes, the corresponding probability vanishes and photoionization cross section actually goes through a minimum, which is called as the Cooper minimum. And this is a property of great interest in photoionization physics. So, you will get some introduction to this. You will also um, uh, learn about what is meant by a dipole approximation, what is a dipole approximation, why is it called a dipole approximation and what are the consequences of dipole approximation. So, most of our discussion will be essentially on the dipole approximation, but the tools that we will develop can be very easily extended to other multipole transitions as well. And in modern day atomic spectroscopy, it is certainly very necessary to go well beyond the dipole approximation, but you will get some sort of a start um, in that consideration. You will also learn about what are known as sum rules, oscillator strength sum rules like the Thomas Ritchie cone uh, sum rules and so on. So, we will derive these expressions in this unit and we will also get the famous Cooper's Zare formula, which for angular distribution of photo electrons. So, they tell us which is the direction in which 
electrons are more likely to be emitted or if they are showing an angular dependence, how is that angular dependence to be estimated. So, in the non relativistic quantum mechanics this is done using a formalism developed by Cooper and Zaer. So, you will learn the Cooper Zaer formula, but then of course, when you do relativistic quantum mechanics you have to make corrections to the Cooper Zaer formula. So, the relativistic expressions were developed by Walker and Weber and we will only give you the references for this, because uh, the, it will go beyond the scope of this course. And then you can also plug in the electron correlation. So, you need a relativistic many body theory to get the correct expressions and you will find it in the work by Johnson and Lin and some others also. So, you will get some sort of an introduction to the angular distribution of photo electrons. And then in the last unit, uh, we will talk about an atom in various external fields. So, uh, we would have already considered uh, interaction of an atom with electromagnetic radiation. So, but in this unit, we will talk specifically about um, the famous Stark effect, the Zeeman effect, and then we will also take into account further corrections like the fine structure, the hyperfine structure, and it will lead us to the consideration of some very exciting phenomena in modern day atomic physics, when you also deal with quantum collisions, cor electron correlations and so on, then you get into the domain of exciting phenomena like laser cooling, the Bose-Einstein condensation, cooperative phenomena, correlated phenomena and um, fast processes, autosecond processes and so on. So, this would be the subject in unit 8. We will find that in the presence of an external field, you have the atom behaves differently, because the presence of the external field like the Stark field for example, it can actually change the lifetime of an excited state. Um, so, we will learn about some of these things when we deal with the Stark effect. We will recognize that in the presence of an electric field L is not a good quantum number. So, you have to consider the transitions uh, in the presence of an electric field. So, you have to use completely different kind of quantum mechanics, use perturbative methods uh, dealing with degenerate states. So, we will get some acquaintance with these techniques. And then we will also learn about what happens when you place an atom in a magnetic field. And there is a family of interactions which are known as the Zeeman family. It includes what is called as the normal Zeeman effect, but also the anomalous Zeeman effect and also an effect which is named after Pastian and Back. And these are named differently just because they correspond to different magnitudes of the magnetic field that you can control, okay. but for historical reasons they have these different names. And we will discuss what is it that happens, how does an atom respond to a magnetic field. When you change the external magnetic field, you can make it strong or weak or moderate and these terms are qualitative terms, they obviously have some implicit reference and the implicit reference in this consideration is the spin orbit interaction, which is internal to the atomic structure. So, with reference to the spin orbit interaction, the field that you are dealing with, which you are applying externally, is it really weak or is it about the same value, or equally strong or stronger. So, these are some of the considerations that we will have in studying an atom, atom in a magnetic field, we will find that the d 1 d 2 lines get split into a large number of transitions. And you can um, study these spectroscopically, spectroscopically. and then we will also uh, once we have the tools for the Zeeman effect, we will also have studied a little bit of the hyperfine structure, how it affects the energy level spectra and how these can be exploited to subject an atom to repeated cycles of cooling by exposing it to radiation pressure. By exposing it to radiation pressure, the atom gets a kick, but then it once it gets excited as a result of absorption of this electromagnetic energy, when it comes down to the ground state, it emits the absorbed energy in random directions. And when this is done cyclically, the atom would actually cool down. So, this is the essence of laser cooling and we will discuss some of this toward the end of unit 8. In fact, when 
the momentum of the atom comes down is de Broglie wavelength increases lambda is h over p. So, lambda increases and if the atoms are bosons you can actually get a Bose Einstein condensation. So, uh, we will uh, introduce you to this. We will also talk about Fermi mixtures, because you can have fermion atoms which can constitute pairs and you can pair them using some external you know controls like magnetic fields, which uh, will induce certain resonant phenomena by controlling the scattering length. So, that requires you know tools in quantum collision theory and in particular the things like the Fano flashback resonance is exploited in this. So, that you can form completely new states of matter like the fermionic condensates. So, the Bose-Einstein condensate itself is a different kind of matter which you do not, which perhaps does not exist anywhere else in the universe, but maybe it does. If there is life elsewhere and they did it before us, I have no idea about that. But then it is a different kind of state of matter altogether and then you can also have the fermionic condensates. So, uh, this enables us to develop you know cool down the atoms which is a good thing to measure time, because you need slow atoms and cooled atoms to measure time accurately. And you need extremely high accuracy in the measurement of time at the level of autoseconds. And that is the current day technology that people are developing. But to study this one requires fairly sophisticated tools in quantum collision theory, as well as in the study of many electron systems and in particular the Coulomb correlations, which we had sort of averaged out in the Hartree Fock formalism, which we would have you know leveled out or averaged out at the Hartree Fock level or in the Dirac Hartree Fock. The, these correlation effects are not taken into account and they must be taken into account to study these phenomena. So, that becomes a subject of a different course and this is pretty much the overview of this course and in the next class we will begin with the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom. So, any questions can certainly be sent to me, thank you.